Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, we've now arrived at 2016. We've, we've done it. We've been here since 2016 this year and we're looking forward to 2017 and so I've gone through all of my memoirs during this year and all the issues that we've, we've dealt with uh, during the 2016 and had to figure out well, what tends to stand out or if not that from a futuristic standpoint what should we maintain if you will in a community and in all due respect I was part and parcel of putting District 18 together when I was at the Portland Observer newspaper and we've made many, many efforts in that in that area, if you will. In fact, we put boundaries. We put boundaries in the so-called black community, because in most cases, from a historical standpoint, the black community was where was it? I mean, we didn't even know where the boundaries were. And so, that, as a result of that, the 18 uh, came up, uh, because as I was at the Observer, I was saying, well, look, if it's going to be a black community, that's its focus should be within this area, but it needs boundaries. And so, long and short of it all is, education was a very key issue. Uh, during that particular time, and and it still is a, a very key issue to date, as we hear. So the idea was, what could we do to end the year 16, going into 17, trying to figure out where do we go from here in the area of education? We still have a number of our young people within the community, not only just in, in the black community, quote, the black community, but in the Oregon community. There are a lot of kids that are in need, big time. But, the, but leading that particular point, that we felt that it would have been very supportive by this time and kids would have been educated and being able to get their jobs and, and deal with their issues and whatever. In fact, assimilate into a society uh, being well, well, let's see, well-read citizens and, and uh, paying their taxes and this, that, and the other. And you say to yourself, wow, we still have the same problem. And I think about it, I, I, I was kind of like part and parcel of that process at one point in time for some time. And I'm talking about McCoy Academy. I was part of the board at that point in time, at one point in time, and spent quite a bit of time with McCoy Academy. And here today, McCoy, I'm not there anymore, but I'm still there, still very interested in our youth across the board. A number of those individual young people have assimilated. It's not just the black community. It's a community where a number of, the, a number of these young people are uh, African-Americans, white. I mean, they're across the board. And there's, an, again, like I said, it was McCoy Academy. And I, I'm fortunate today that what I'm going to do today is that uh, I'm going to reflect 2016 from the standpoint of trying to talk to you about an issue that we still have a major concern with. And I'm talking about uh, our youth in the, in the Northeast Corridor. And the, and the entity that, that represented that youth in terms of the education endeavor, because that's a very key piece, is, is, is McCoy Academy. And I, I don't know if you know McCoy Academy, but you might want to Google it. But, the, but what we have today, we have the live person right here with us today. I'm talking about with Becky Black. Becky is right here with us. She's with us today, and I'm gonna, I want her to spend, I want to highlight uh, McCoy Academy as what I feel was the highlight, if you will, of 2016 as it relates to the Oregon Voters Digest, and i.e., and for the coming years, that it be, be a, one of your main staples, if you will, on the front line in terms of how do we, how do we keep this, how do we keep this effort going in terms of reaching out to those young people that in most cases are hard to reach out from the standpoint of public schools? I'm just being straight up with you, okay, with that. So, Becky, welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate that very Thank much. Thank you. It's, it's been good great. to be here. Thank you very, very much, very much. Why don't we just kind of just give the, give the viewing arts an opportunity to meet you, uh, to meet McCoy Academy, uh, to meet uh, the, the kids of McCoy Academy, to meet the status of McCoy Academy, and where is McCoy Academy going? We, we, we're gonna, so we got a good hour that we're gonna spend some time with you. You are the feature of 2016. I thought it would have been totally resolved, but you're the one. We still have major, major problems with our youth, and, uh, and the only thing they're looking forward to in many cases is the criminal justice system. And that's a sad note to say that. So if you would just kind of share with us uh, one it's Oregon for the benefit of the newcomers. We got a lot of newcomers here within our community. If you will, it's, it's being said that it's being gentrified. They don't know. And they, they need to know this history, if you will, of what this community, all the efforts. And, and I'm thinking about all the dollars 
that has been sent to this particular area, you would have thought that, uh, gee whiz, you wouldn't have to worry about any working anymore. <laughs> but, but, but the fact of the matter is, it's changing. It's a changing community, but we still have a lot of the elements that are here. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. still their home, and, and McCoy Cabinet, this is still their home. You still have your, you know, you're still here. You're part of this community, okay? With that, we're going to give the floor to you. How about that? Well, thank you, Bruce. Um, first of all, it's the Gladys McCoy Academy. Um, our students actually named the school, um, and Gladys was, and her husband were uh, activists in the community. Um, she was the first uh, black on the school board. She was Multnomah County Commissioner. He was a senator. So our students wanted to name the school after someone that they respected who was from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so it became, it was a toss-up at that time between Clyde Drexler and Gladys McCoy. Really? <laughs> but Gladys wow. won. So we became the McCoy Academy. But Bruce, that was uh, almost 29 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I moved to Northeast Portland in 88 and there had been the first gang shooting. And um, so I became, I, I started working with the gang task force the first week I was here. Over a period of time, realized the high number of young people in this community who had dropped out of school or weren't in school. And it was astronomical, the number of young people who weren't in school. So uh, my husband and I uh, developed a school program the first year we worked with young men coming out of McLaren, uh, helping them get their education, get back into the community, get counseling, get jobs. We opened a middle school for those young people who had been expelled. We opened a school for those with drug and alcohol issues that needed intervention and treatment plus their education. So that was all in one year. Mm -hmm. And then um, realizing that we had stepped into a new career practically. We sought out some help from other programs across, across the country and found a model that we could uh, get a grant to help set up. And so we moved all three programs into one building and became the Gladys McCoy Academy. So our focus after all these years has been the community and young people who have not made it in traditional school. Right now there are still hundreds and hundreds of young people in North and Northeast Portland who have dropped out of school that actually we have found out want to be in school. But over the years, we have struggled with funding. From time to time, we have had contracts with the district and majority of the time, we have not. And in the last few years, Portland has seized contracting with a high number of their alternative schools. All the other schools that lost funding closed their doors, that without that funding, they couldn't remain open. Mm -hmm. We decided that we were going to stay open no matter what. We started the program without any money, so mm -hmm. we were used to being poor. So we've kept our doors open. Um, the problem being that we can only serve 15 students at this time with the limited amount of money that we get through donations and grants. But we have another same number out there who want to get into the program. If we could raise enough money to take in more students, those young people are there. Mm -hmm. They want to be in school. We're an accredited high school, just like any of the other high schools hmm. in the area. So our students graduate with a high school diploma. Um, so at the end of this year, we're looking at something happening to our building, which is happening all over North and Northeast Portland. Yeah. It's going to be tore down and apartment complexes put up. And the building hosts a lot of history. Uh, very many of the nonprofits in Northeast Portland have had been in that building at one time mm -hmm. until we took over the whole building. And uh, so after being in that building all these years, we are sad to say that it's going to be tore down yeah. like many of the other yeah. old standards in the community. And so two things are happening. One is we have to raise funds to stay alive. And secondly, we have to find a spot, hopefully in the same community. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have said, why stay? We have contracts with other school districts that support us, and that it's often said, why stay in North and Northeast mm -hmm. Portland when you don't get money to keep the program alive? Why don't you just move into one of those districts that, that will pay for those students to be served? Mm -hmm. But my home and my heart is in North and Northeast Portland. I've been determined for 28 years and stay determined to keep the doors open. And 
if you had the opportunity to interview every one of my students, you couldn't help but say, we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. We've got to help these mm -hmm. students graduate. Mm -hmm. We've got to open the door to other students like them who want to graduate, who need a small setting, who need individual attention, who need an accelerated program so that they can earn the credits they've lost over the past. So we offer year-round school. Our students can uh, study 12 months out of the year. Rather, Even when we have contracts, we don't get paid for mm -hmm, summer, mm -hmm. but we manage to stay open. Um, so we are in um, a bit of desperate need right mm -hmm. now that we hope the community can step forward and help us either keep the building or help us find a spot very close to mm -hmm. where we are. Mm -hmm. We were the first, our neighbors love us, we were the first school in Portland to be designated a drug-free zone. And that was back in the early 90s. Hmm. And um, there were crack houses on the corner. There was a lot of violence. Our students uh, went through the process of getting us designated drug-free. Now I think every school in Portland is designated drug-free. But that has helped that neighborhood that we're in. Yeah. So our neighbors don't want us to move. We don't want to move. But uh, at the very least, we want to stay in close proximity. And most of all, keep our doors open for those young people who want to be in school, who aren't in school right now, those who are in school with us and want to graduate. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and just thinking back, and you know, you, you've got... I mean, you could just talk about a many of the issues about, you know, your endeavors and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But let me ask you a couple of things. I think about the first thing that came to mind was in terms of funding. What happened to charter school? I mean, uh, why is it such a problem to have charter school with Portland Public School? They get more money than anyone else in the United States. If you, uh, They have funding SEI. I mean, I know that they're, they're, they're a charter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the problem? And you were there before. Well, I don't. SCI. I don't believe it's so much of a problem anymore. There are several charter schools in Portland. Okay. But Bruce, you have to remember back. Deal? I was on the front lines of trying to get charter legislation passed, and it was not a popular idea. So I won't go into the details. But you were the point but, person. Uh, uh huh. We were the second charter in the state. The first was in Sio. We were the second, um, but it was a real political battle, and. Uh, if you go back and read a study by the City Club of Portland, you can read what happened, and uh, what happened was not it was not legal. It it wasn't okay, but uh, but Which now I think I what think about the City Club? Where were they? They did there? they did a study on the history of charter schools and the process to bring charter schools into Portland and right. how that how that happened despite Portland Public Schools and the battle that ensued between charter proponents and the district. Mm -hmm. And they did an extensive study and published a pamphlet that's available through City Club of what they found out. But now I think the way has been cleared for others and now I don't know how many but there are numerous charter schools in Portland and I, I think the uh, overall view has changed and the mm -hmm. politics has changed which I'm really grateful for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what about but what about the Glass McCoy? We aren't a charter school we are considered private we're the only private school that doesn't for low-income students that do, doesn't charge uh, tuition for our students or their parents so um, we're a designated private school, but unlike a lot of private schools that, that want to be private, that mm -hmm. start out as a private school, mm -hmm. we became private because we didn't get funding from the district. So we became a private school. So we are an alternative school, but we're also private. And again, uh, we stay open, contingent on assistance from the community to keep our doors open. Mm -hmm. <sighs> But that, but there's no opportunities there anymore. You, you're saying if there was an opportunity to get funding from Portland Public Schools, would that, that would be, be wonderful. Uh, I think right now they're really trying to bring in more of the dropouts that are out there, and uh, I met with them only a week ago, and they have people that are going out and basically knocking on doors, finding those young people, mm -hmm. and encouraging them to get back in school. Well, if they were to fund us, I could get them probably 30, 15 or 16 now mm -hmm. and 15 or 20 more within a couple of weeks who are begging to be in school. Mm -hmm. So I think right now what I would like to see is true collaboration between Portland Public Schools and our program. We're very small when you look at how many youth that they are supporting and, and we're very small. But these students are important and and they have been let go. They have fallen through the cracks. And every one of them has a story. Everyone has a story. And most have had 
situations in their family that a lot of us can't even conceive of. Mm -hmm. Despite that, they want an education. They want to be in school. But circumstances, teen parenting, poverty, moving from place to place, being in foster home after foster home, being homeless, circumstances have caused them to leave the public school system. Right. But their only hope is an education. Their only hope is to get back into school. And that's why we're there. And that's what our mission is. And we only wish that we could bring in more of those young people and do more. Mm -hmm. well, you know, but you know, but as I think about, as I think, I say McCoy Academy, but it's actually Glass McCoy Academy. But, 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 the, but, the, but as I think about the, what you do and look at your track record, you know, the box. You know, you, you you got a photo. You went Wheaties on the on the Wheaties box of all <laughs> things. There, there's this photo of, of Becky on Wheaties, and and um, that was quite an accolade that they gave you. And that was the uh, the Portland Red Cross. Portland, Portland Red Cross. They do Breakfast of Champions, and, and they do the Wheaties boxes, and that was an honor. They an honor. honored us as the Community Education Program of the Year. Okay, okay. And again, again, I'm still trying to get get into Becky to have Becky share with us. She was the she was a focal point. I mean, she's she's been there day in and day out, and that's not an easy task. Well, that's true. Well, that, <laughs> I can't that, deny that. Yeah, that, that I can't not deny an easy that. Task. I mean, you I pretty well de that. dedicated your whole life. You and your husband, Cy. By the way, he's passed at this point in time, but he's still with us. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. still with us. Well, one of the things I'd like to mention, Bruce, is the things that our students have been able to do. Just a couple examples. Um, as you as you know, we had the first all African American firefighting crew made up primarily of gang members mm -hmm. uh, that we got into school and got out on the fire line and saw amazing things happen with those young people. More counseling and education can happen on a fire line than any time behind a desk. So that went on for a number of years, the Freedom Firefighters, and I still have men come to my office and talk about their memories of that. Um, we had a, a group made up of Crips and Bloods that worked on the initial demolition of the House of Amosia. The concern was that it would be seen as belonging to one or other of the gangs that were prevalent in that neighborhood. And so I formed a, fire, or a construction crew and contracted with Walsh Construction. And we had half and half of Crips and Bloods and they did the initial work on that mm -hmm. building. And to this day, again, men will come to my office and say, remember, I'm the one who built the House mm -hmm. of Emotion. Mm -hmm. So they have good memories of that. Um, but recently, um, and those were, became a part of the school, things that we were able to do with our students. Mm -hmm. In the last two years, our students have formed, it's called a Rotary Interact Club. Albina Rotary sponsors us, and our students became a Rotary Interact Club, and that's a high school club made up of young people whose motto is service above self. And all of our students are members, and last year they picked, they had to pick a project, and they picked Matari, Zimbabwe. And at the time, we didn't know, it's a sister city of Portland, and it's a very poor village. And our students found out about it through a person in a church who went there occasionally. So they adopted Matari, and our students collected uh, all kinds of medical supplies and dental supplies and clothing. And our president was able to go to Matari last summer hmm. and spend two months and come back with a wonderful video of what our students did to help him get there and his experience there. This year, our students are uh, tackling homelessness in Portland. Last week, our students spent a day out at Dignity Village talking to the, the residents out there, finding out what it was like. They're going to paint one of the buildings out there when we come back after mm -hmm. break. They've also brought homeless people in and people who are in the resources that are helping the homeless. So they're getting a firsthand view of their own of their own city. Mm -hmm. And these are young people who had dropped out, who weren't part who weren't part of the system, who are now working to help build a better community mm -hmm. and to help in their community. And I find that the students we get are all willing because they've been through poverty, they've been through a lot. They're at a point in their lives when they want to help. And we can't just leave them sitting home watching mm -hmm. television when they're saying they want to be in school. Mm -hmm. And there's not one solution. And most of them have tried other programs. And we try to get those into other programs that we can't, that we can't serve. That's not always possible. Mm -hmm. Many have been in other programs that it hasn't worked for them. So 
we would love to be able to bring them into the program. I could spend an hour telling you the amazing projects our students have been a part of and what they've done in the community quietly, mm -hmm. quietly and, and with uh, much attention being paid to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think folks, again, I, I'm interviewing Becky Black um, uh, of McCoy Academy, Gladys McCoy Academy, and she's giving you a little history in terms of of, of of the of the academy and who Gladys was and who Bill was and they were very much involved uh, in the community. Both were elected to office and uh, both African Americans, you know, right up front with you and and both contributed quite a bit. In fact, uh, their kids are still around. You, get, you might have seen Paul McCoy. Paul's been around for quite some time also too. But the McCoy family has has done a lot here in the mm -hmm. community aspect of it. But primarily here now is that there's a problem here, you know. I mean, yeah. with all that money that was being that's being spent, even to date, you may imagine if one were to able to say, okay, how much money has been spent in Northeast Portland? And that was one of my major point in regards to putting boundaries on it, because a lot of the money is once they were they were intended to come to the area, were actually spent for other things. Mm -hmm. When I think about mm -hmm. PDC, Portland Development Commission, PDCs, the, the definition of PDC was basically to help poor families in the black community. It was originally located in northeast Portland on, at the time, Union Avenue. Mm -hmm. That's where it all started, if you will. In fact, Neil Kelly was, I think, was the first president of the board, if you will. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that but, but, but the intent was to create home ownership. And now today, it's not about home ownership creation. Right. It's about anything other than, but the monies are still coming here to Oregon, i.e. Portland, but not doing what it was intentionally, initially it was supposed to be, be focused on. So it's really, it's a problem. That's, a, that's another major problem we have here now, even from the standpoint of the leadership. You know, I'm thinking about, as I talk to you, I'm thinking about what about the leadership? What about the, the black leaders? Or what about the, the elected leaders, if you will? Uh, that uh, w w would would have responded, if you will, to what you're doing. I'm thinking about the Lou Fredericks now. To date, I'm asking the question: of, have, you, have you seen Lou, if you will, trying to set up that uh, problem? I think about the Margaret Carters of the world. I, th I mean, my point is that, and I'm not trying to knock them in a personal standpoint, but the intent. And a lot of times, people voted for them, thinking that they were going to resolve some of the problems that we had in Oregon, i.e. black community, which is identified here in the Northeast Corridor, District 18. That's what I was doing when I was at the Portland Observer newspaper, rather than being selfishness and just saying, well, I'll run for office if I created it. I didn't do that. The idea was that, i.e., the idea was to get someone from the community who happened to be in. Chances of, of getting an African-American elected to office mm -hmm. would be a bit, not a black community, but a community where a number of the residents happened to be black you know what I mean, with boundaries. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we got Margaret Carter. And at the end of that, that was it. In all due respect, I, I like Margaret, but the fact of the matter is once she gets in Salem, they want to, they basically they took the money with them, so to speak, <laughs> and they kept it in Salem and they spent it elsewhere. So consequently, Margaret wasn't really able to identify with the issues uh, at, at that point in time. My point is that it, it, it's all the same. You know what I mean? I think about the, the Brooks, if you will, the, even Sam Brooks to a certain degree. With the Oami aspect of it, uh, the, the idea was to put together kind of a, a deal to outreach, if you will, to start with on the back of blacks. Mm -hmm. So he gets the money, right? PG and a lot of the entities got together and got this building, uh, got two buildings for that matter, and the one that's located <coughs> on uh, Vancouver, I think it's Vancouver and Shaver or something like that. I think it's moved. It's moved. Was that? Which one is it? Is that right? That's Wami. That was yeah, yeah, Wami, but I'm moved. not sure if they're still there. Yeah, no, they're not there anymore. Yeah. They've leased the building up in Delta Park. But my point is that now they've got high rise there. Mm -hmm. And that was a non profit. But the whole intent, if you will, was to develop, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. develop African Americans in that area, whether it be contractors or training, whatever. My, my thought would have been okay, fine, if you're going to do something like that, put a, put a training facility down below on mm -hmm. the first level and continue those efforts. And then if you want to do high rise, fine. But I'm, and I'm not trying to, I'm just saying, but who's checking on these things that are on? I mean, it's, well, Bruce, I think, what, what do we I, do? I think that uh, everybody is handling a lot. And uh, as I said before, we're a very small entity. I know. And my sympathies and best wishes go out to those people that are working in Salem for us. Um, but in terms of what's happening in our community, right. the gentrification, it has affected so many of our families. 
Um, I have students who have had to move out into Southeast who will ride the bus still and come over to our school Jeez. because it worked for them, but yeah. their families had to move. Yeah. Um, one of the things that frightened me at this time is uh, when I moved in 88, as I mentioned before, there had been the first gang shooting. At this point in time, I feel like we've moved backwards, yeah. that we're back in the late 80s and early 90s. I'm seeing the same kind of gang activity, senseless gang activity, the shootings that are matter of fact. And uh, I feel like, what have we accomplished the last 28 years? Uh, and why are we still doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. We get together, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. the rallies, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. the mothers come mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and we talk about, we've got to tackle this problem. I don't know what I can do other than what we've been doing, which is try to reach out with education. Mm -hmm. And when I was working with young men who had been gang leaders coming out of McLaren, I saw in them the need, to, the desire to do something different and to have a good life. but. We've had preventative programs funded and those fundings, fund, the funding taken away. And I just feel like after 28 years, it's really depressing to think that it seems like at least on the street, we're seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And yet in our program, we've had over 400 graduates. And I, I talk, if not weekly, monthly, young people who come, young people who are now middle-aged come in and talk to me about how one or two incidents changed their lives, how uh, something that was done, and some of them, after they left us, went through more problems, mm -hmm. but eventually came around and have families and have jobs and come in, and sometimes I wish I was recording those visits because mm -hmm. it tells the story of the importance of getting the education, mm -hmm. but as important is the relationship that is built with a staff in a school and those young people and the difference it can make. One word, one day, one action can make a difference that will turn a young person's life around. And when I have young people knocking on my door, wanting to come into the program, wanting to change their lives, and I have to turn them away, it's heartbreaking. And I'm thinking it it's just not right. It shouldn't be this way. That's why I would hope that there could be a collaboration mm -hmm. with Portland Public Schools, um, with the city, with the county, with, I don't mind being independent. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you can do more yeah. when you're yeah. independent, but you have to have the funds. It's really difficult to but be But the independent. funds were dedicated to that area. I mean, dedicated to, to in the terms of the resolutions of the, what they perceived are the problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've got Black Lives Matters. We've got, I mean, people react like you're saying. Things haven't changed. It's just going back the other way, you know. And young people are very upset. And so, where are the leadership? Where is the leadership? What about the school board? You know, I, I've, I've had Steve on here. I've not talked with him about this uh, of late. But uh, where are the where are these guys? Where, where are the people? Well, I'm getting. Um, I have to say, very... I'm getting more support from the school board than I have in the past. There are members of the school board, including Steve, who I'm talking with, who are sympathetic to the cause. And, Paul Anthony is another uh, guy. I, I haven't spoke with you him, to Paul but yet? Okay. Uh, I actually sent him an email the okay. last the last yeah. week, and so I think there's some support being generated, but the answers are the same. I've talked with people at Portland Public Schools that I respect that I would think really care about these issues and about the kids, mm -hmm. but the final word is always there's just no funding, there's wow. no funding, and that's always the final answer that uh, there's no funding, and they do have a. RFP process where they put out an RFP and you respond if you want to get funding for your school and they just did that nobody notified us we didn't know that the RFP had come out so we missed the deadline and they only do it once every five years so we'd like to know why we weren't notified mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also we would like to find if there's any way what what I discovered in the last week because we're operating on so little that I do count on volunteers. I, I have part-time teachers. I rely on volunteers. But right now, I think the amount that the district gets uh, per student, and when, when you consider all the entitlements, comes out to between eleven and thousand dollars a year per student. Right now, we're figuring that we're spending thirty-three hundred a year on our students, which is nothing compared to what the districts get. And yet it's working, the kids, but think how many students we can serve and how many 
how much yeah. better we could do, how, how much more we could give our students if we had half of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, uh, 3300 a year will keep our doors open per student, wow. which tells you our teachers don't make wow. a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. But anybody who's working there has a passion for the youth and is there because they see what's happening. They see that lives are changing and they want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to, to do that on little or no money. Mm -hmm. And so the passion and the desire is there. Uh, and I only hope that our program and other programs, I think there are other small programs, but over the last 28 years, I have seen almost all the nonprofits close. Yes. That even wow. those that had millions of dollars in grants have not been able to stay open and alive. Uh, so, as I said before, my husband and I determined when we started with no e money, e we would continue if we had e no money, e e but that we wouldn't shut the door uh, to the youth that are knocking on it. Although now at this point, we're having to shut the door on an awful lot of youth that we well, can't Well, that, that can't happen. That can't happen. We can't do that because, in all due respect, to we just can't. I mean, especially when you when you look at the lay of the land. We just had an election, if you will, of the new president, if you will, based on on these this same issue that we're talking about right now, right now, because what's going to happen with the future of these these young people? Those are the futures. That's the future. Look, what we're going to do? We're going to take a short break. We're going to open up the lines. We're going to open up the line. Do call in. We're going to put the number up there, and you can call in and. Whether you're a former student uh, or you may want to just, just share your thoughts about what we're talking about here. Again, we're talking about an area that you've been paying for for years and you're still <laughs> paying for. But where is the money going? Here's a program that as far as I'm concerned, this is what, this is what we, we're talking about. Reaching out to those young people that you see demonstrating downtown and things of that nature and, and the criminal justice system. You hear about the number, of, if you will, of incarceration of African Americans. So... Wait a minute, what's, something's wrong here. They're falling through the crack. Portland Public School is still considered to be the largest failure rate for African Americans in the state, in the, well, for, for kids. The largest failure rate, if you will, in, this, in the state of Oregon, right here in Portland. And here's just this little program that's, that's been, well, anyway. We'll take a short break, and please, we're going to open up the line and do call in, okay? We'll take a short break. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back again to Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. If you've been with us for the last 30 minutes or so, I've been talking, if you will, about an issue, as far as I'm concerned, there's been a, still a major, major, major issue in the so-called Northeast Corridor, uh, Northeast Portland, for the state of Oregon, where you have many of your tax dollars. Many of you, I'm talking about, I'm talking to you people all throughout the state of Oregon. You have been pay, being paid, you have been paying, if you will, for a solution, if you will, to African Americans and other kids, if you will, across the board if you will, that lives in an area that, in all due respect, lacks the education. And, uh, you know, and, and Portland Public School has been, i.e., the main staple, if you will, the education in the area, but in all due respect, they're not reaching out to those, fo those young people that are falling in the cracks. And you're seeing them on the streets now, downtown, demonstrating and this, that, and the other, and you're trying to figure out what the heck did we do? Well, we got some solutions here, and I, I, I'm very familiar with McCoy Academy. It has a history of working hard, but the politics a lot of time gets caught up in a lot of the things that we're doing today. And you know, in all due respect, politics is not about the future. We, we're getting ready to go into four tumultuous years, four years here that's getting ready to come up with the newly elected president. That's right. We spent eight years, we spent eight years talking about race. Now we got to start talking about solutions. And that's really what we're talking about right now. That's why this guy got elected, if you will, because he was an outsider. People are not interested in politics. But it's going to take us all working together. Wow. It's going to take all of us working together. All we need to know is figure out what happened to all of that money that's sitting up here in Northeast Portland that basically said, this is what we want to accomplish. We want to make sure that these kids are educated so that they can basically go out and make a decent living and pay their taxes on equal footings. But, we, but something's happening here. We're not responding to it. We hear a whole bunch of stuff about blacks and this, that, 
But let's, let's see if we can get to the bottom of it. We've opened up the line. We've opened up the line that we want you to call in. Former students, anyone who has been familiar with McCoy Academy in the past, he was, I'm sorry, I got, I got so excited, I'm knocking the, knocking the mic off. I'm knocking, sorry about that, buddy. Sorry about that, Jim. Sorry about that, Jim. But Let's this, clean this up yeah, here, yeah, Bruce. Right, right. Gee, I'm, I'm, I'm just so, I mean, you know, you just go on and on and on. And I think about myself, you know, I, 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 I've contributed through the years and years. I didn't necessarily have to be staying in this particular area. I could have been doing IBM. I could have been building houses. I built one senior citizen complex in Northeast Portland. I wish I had built more. I was providing housing and home ownership for a lot of folks, but again, like you, the politics got in it. I didn't see anybody running to my doorstep saying, Bruce, what can we do to help you out? And I was a private venture. I was just a regular private venture. I've run for office. I just run, ran for the, the mayorship not too long ago, and, and I put down some issues that are on the table about the, the homeless mm -hmm. and Wapato, the building that's sitting up there right now empty. Here it is uh -huh. right in the cold of winter, and we still got, we got people on the sidewalks I mean, nowhere to go, freezing to death and this, that, and the other. But we got politicians, if you will, and they're reacting to the folks that, who basically gave them the money to run because they are developers and they want that property. That's all it's all about. It's all about the money. They want that property in Guapato. That's what the deal is. Just like in, to a certain degree, here you are, you know, you, you're doing a service, if you will, to, to, a, a, to an area, uh, especially those kids and whatever, and the developer comes in to the, to the owner of the property and says, hey, look, uh, we're going to build you some high rise and whatever she, she might want to hold back or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, it's, it's really a sad note. Now we're going to have these kids out. If Becky's not around, what's going to happen then? Then we got, then we got more demonstrations. Then we have more problems. So look, here's an opportunity. We got to really reach out to these young people. Again, like I said, this was 2016. You think we were, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, Becky could have been retired by now. <laughs> she, she'd run out of kids, but she's not run out of kids. They're knocking at the door, but they, she, can't, she can't provide. She's got regulations she's got to abide by. So many kids that can go in those rooms, et cetera. There's so many kids she can do this, this, that, that the teachers, I mean, you know, they've got to eat. And she's not paying, I know she's not paying them the same rate that the public schools are paying them. By no means, I know that. I was on the board. I, I saw the numbers. <laughs> I saw the numbers during my time on, on the board. But, um, but like I said, I'm highlighting this for 2016, thinking that that should have been resolved. That should have been solved. But Becky, what, 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 you got to tell me a you little know, bit more I, about Obviously, this. Bruce, I don't have the answer because I'd sure be sharing it if Gee. I did. And uh, I think for me, I've come to the conclusion that I have to do what I can do. That mm -hmm. I can't. I can't figure everything out. I can't try to understand why things are the way they are. Even though I want to keep abreast of the news and of what's happening yeah. in our community yeah. and in the state yeah. and in the world, I'm concerned about a girl in my program, a boy in my program, these individual kids, and how how's their family going to eat? Where are they going to live? I think some of us have to work with whatever it is we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has gifts and everybody has things they can do. But if we can bring it down, and I don't want to say the lower level, but to the personal level, when you know the individuals instead of, let's just talk about the homeless. Well, I want to bring homeless people into my school to talk to the kids. So mm -hmm. they talk to somebody who's sleeping under the mm -hmm. bridge. So mm -hmm. they know what brought them there, right. what not to do, what choices not to make, wow. what we can do. And as I meet my students um, and talk to them, uh, as much as I would like to solve the problem of the greater community, I go home thinking about individuals and their situation and what can we do to help them. Uh, I wish I had solutions for the, for the, the bigger problems, but mm -hmm. education of our young people is a big problem. Mm -hmm. yes. But you, you start small, you know, but I think what we have is a model and that we have to provide opportunities for those students that we can't reach, mm -hmm. those students that are growing up in poverty and violence and homelessness, and there are thousands of those students. And we have to provide other opportunities mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. and ways to help them. And by helping them, you're helping the family, you're helping them, you're helping their parents, you're helping their relatives, you're helping the community at mm -hmm. large. And I, I find that that's, 
that's what I've been called to do, mm -hmm. and that's what I'll keep doing. Mm -hmm. And I gave up a long time ago trying to figure out where the money's going. Mm -hmm. I know where it's not going, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. often know where yeah, it is yeah. going. Uh, I have a student now, which is, this is really rewarding. I have a young man now. He's the vice president of our Interact Club. He, his mother graduated from McCoy, and he was an infant in our daycare. Hmm several years ago wow. and now he's a student in our program so many of our students it has been a family someone in the family came and they were successful mm -hmm. and our graduation at warner pacific college is an amazing event uh, we have students that are the first in their family to graduate high school mm -hmm. and uh, that auditorium is filled with families that are so proud of those mm -hmm. students and of course our goal is to let them know high school is not the end of it you've just mm -hmm. begun right. that we got to We've got to work with you. What do you do next? Mm -hmm. A high school diploma is not enough. You've got to take the next, next step. And that's our goal. But at the same time, it is so rewarding to see these young people that are maybe the first in their family and then their brothers and sisters following mm -hmm. and signing up mm -hmm. and enrolling with us mm -hmm. and being successful. So uh, someone asked me the other day where we're getting these students, and so much of it is word of mouth. So much of it is from families in North and Northeast Portland mm -hmm. whose family members have graduated from McCoy. It's a program that many people in our community can't remember when it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And everybody almost knows somebody who graduated yeah, exactly. from there right. who was struggling. And um, so it has its own rewards. They're not monetary, but anybody who's out there doing work in the community, mm -hmm. um, whether you see the results or not, they're there. Mm -hmm. One individual at a time, there are results. Mm -hmm. And so I really respect all you others out there in the community that are doing quietly doing work in your church basement, working with kids, mm -hmm. feeding kids, mm -hmm. working with families. Mm -hmm. You get no attention or, mm -hmm. or little press or anything, but you're doing it. You're going and doing it every day. And uh, I respect those people. I think more has been done in Northeast Portland through churches mm -hmm. and uh, little nonprofits and outreach efforts that have really... Uh, impacted families then all the big dollars and the big programs i think has had more of an impact but obviously it's not enough mm -hmm. like i said in many ways i feel like we're back in 1990 mm -hmm. and more needs to be done and obviously different things need to be done we need to figure out what what has worked what hasn't and mm -hmm. what we can do mm -hmm. what we can do about it what changes can we make because mm -hmm. we're still losing way too many young people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was an article in the paper this weekend about Pete Simpson, who's a Portland police Pete, officer, yeah. and a young man when he was in the great program, and he was speaking at a grade school in northeast Portland, and he had a young 10-year-old who we asked the question after, you know, the great program is targeting middle school students to encourage them to stay out of gangs. Mm -hmm. Pete was doing a speech in one of the programs, and at the end he said, does anybody in here respect gangs? And after his talk, he really expected them to say no. One little boy raised his hand and said, I do. And so Pete asked him the question, why? And he said, his dad is in a gang, his brother's in a gang. He named off all of these relatives that were in gangs. And last week, or recently, Pete had to put out a notice that this young man is wanted for a murder in Northeast Portland. Wow. And I can understand how it broke his heart. And what he said was, when it's a family, when you have a whole family that's been involved, getting one of those young people out of the family is very difficult. Mm -hmm. In our case, we've had young people come to us and be with us for four years, and we've seen strides made. But you have to have some relationship building and some impact on an individual in that family to try to change that pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the work that we're doing now and that we have been doing. And I think we've succeeded one person at a time, but it's not a big enough effort. Mm -hmm. There's for every one that we work with, who graduates, who moves away from that lifestyle, there's 10 more out there that we would like to be able to reach. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as I listen to what you were saying, you know, I'm a frustrated taxpayer. I'm a, fr a frustrated person who, I, well, I'm, I'm 78 years old now, and I've worked hard to, to get what I'm <laughs> doing at this point in time. It could have been an easier way. But it didn't. But I, my point is that I count my dollars. Mm -hmm. But the fact of me is, I'm paying. My dollars are going into this particular community, mm -hmm. and I'm not seeing the results of those dollars. There are many folks. That's why people are so frustrated with, with, in all due respect, with politics. Whether you are Republicans or Democrat, people are frustrated. That's why this outsider, his name is Donald Trump, came uh -huh. up there and said, "Hey, look," and he beat out all of the guys who were established politicians. People are frustrated. 
people are looking for leadership because in all due respect, I can't, in all due respect, hey, I'm out of the middle class. I'm out here trying to survive myself to a certain degree. Many of us are trying to survive. So people want to make sure that are my dollars working here? And they're not. I mean, that's, there's still a lot of dollars going in that particular area. Mm -hmm. And people want to know where are the dollars. In fact, the other thing I'm thinking about, one of the largest uh, fundraisers in the in the state in the country for that matter is called United Way. And I'm asking you the question, have, have they knocked on your door? No. United Way. How many of you are contributing to United Way? How many of you are asking the question, what, what have you done with my dollars? What are the results? You know, I mean, really, you should ask that question. Maybe you ought to put that on your tax form. That's what I think about <laughs> doing that. Rather than paying taxes, I'm going to say, what have you done with the dollars that I'm, <laughs> that I'm sending in at this point in time? No, it, it's a very serious problem, folks. And, and that's why I'm, I'm using the McCoy Academy, because here's, a, here's something that's trying to, uh, something that's working, and we want it to fall through the crack. Who's going to pick up her, who's going to pick up the pathon when you're gone? And I'm just being upfront with you. I, mean, I, I, mean, she, I don't know <laughs> if anyone's crazy enough to. <laughs> no, but my point is that there was a major concern. With, that's what I'm saying. People mm -hmm. are saying, okay, fine. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to find somebody like a Becky to do it. Okay? But at the same time, she wants results. Now, you're getting results. The key is that now we're getting the results, but the fact of the matter is, we say, hey, and we've got systems that are set up to be able to do it. we got United Way. In fact, in fact, folks at the United Way can just dedicate where they want their monies go. I was working for United Way at one uh -huh. point in time. And, you know, we had a service provider that said, here are the problems. I don't know what the, where that is at this point in time. I will be asking them the question uh -huh. come 2000. I do plan to visit them and say, well, okay, fine. Uh, you, you, we got an issue here. You know what I mean? I want to contribute to United Way, but I want my dollars to go here. Because otherwise, uh, if you if you shouldn't go here, then go out and find out why uh -huh. they shouldn't or you shouldn't. But that's what they're supposed to be doing. And people are just saying, well, okay, fine, you're going to take care of the problem? I write my check out. Because at one point in time, they distributed the money. Now they're saying, they're asking you, if you're, if you're working for a corporation or whatever, uh -huh. if you want to distribute it to so-and-so, you can do whatever you want with your money. But I'm still asking the question, how, you, how, you've been here for a long time, 20-some-odd years. How many times have they knocked on your door? We do have individuals that that decide to make their contribution come to But I'm talking about us, United but, Way. Uh, no. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, and I know you're, you, you're well known in the community right off the bat, and that's the part of the job. That's what I was doing when I was working for them out there. So the bottom line, that's United Way. And then that's Portland Public Schools. I mean, if it's the highest, if it's the highest fail, if it shows the highest failure rate for kids here uh, in the state of Oregon, then somebody's got to react to that. They got millions and millions and millions of dollars that are there. And in fact, other communities are picking up on the same thing and trying to draw up this uh, upset because of that situation. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? And I mean, I got SEI, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I've known Tony for years and then they do a job. They mm -hmm. do a good job. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they're doing a part of the job. But there are other entities out here, too. But then there's Portland Public Schools. They're thinking about, what, eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a year per student classroom? And that's if, not if you count the entitlements and all the revenue yes, strands. Right. Twelve thousand yeah. dollars per student, millions and millions of dollars. I'm thinking about the education, if you will, of those teachers that are going there now. I mean, what exposure do they have now in regards to their teacher certificates? It's more than just teaching uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. You got all these other things you got to deal with. You got family mm -hmm. issues. You got all kinds of, because we got second and third generations that have fallen through the crack, mm -hmm. and they're having kids, and now they're on the street. You're right, and I think there's room at the table for for the different approaches. Yes. I have to say that again. Yes. Um, when I think about the average um, public school teacher, and I and I can't envision how it works if you have like six classes a day and 30 students in each class. Right. You can teach, but you can't build those relationships mm -hmm. with the students, and and there is a need for that system. But there's a need for other systems yes. that have other approaches. And who we want are the kids that have tried the others, yeah. that simply have not made it in any other setting. I, I want the students that didn't make it other alternative mm -hmm. schools, that have had serious issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, there's again, there's a place at the table for many, many different approaches. I guess I would like to have more consideration, respect, and some steady funding for programs like ours that are tackling the toughest with the least amount. Mm -hmm. 
we get the toughest and I don't I, I shouldn't call them the most challenging yeah. of students and the least or in this case no amount of dollars to do the job and there hasn't been room for us at the table, but we're still, we're under the table. <laughs> well, you know, Becky, well, you, you make the point, again, I'm, I make in regards to Becky. Becky's been there. You've been there. You've talked to the parents. You've talked to these kids. You know exactly what the problems are. In all due respect, a lot of the teachers in those formal Portland public school type situations, when they get their certificate, they, they don't hit that, hit the streets aspect of it and deal with those kinds of kids. They don't get a degree as a result of that. They're not even introduced to it. Right. See what I'm saying? They're OJT in, in the classroom when they're trying to do reading, writing, and arithmetic. They don't know this other part. So guess what? They get the union, you know, to counter that kind of stuff. And that's why you can't even check. You can't check the folks that are there because they've been taught one way, and it, but, the, but our society is this way in, in certain areas. There's very little education, from what I'm being told, in teacher education programs for working with the most at-risk youth yeah, in, in alternative it. education. It, and I, I understand it's challenging, and, and a lot of the programs doing it are underpaid, even those that are getting paid. But they get and, the dollars in that system to respond to that. That's the problem. Yeah. Whereas here's a program with the, the, the things that you're doing is where the dollars were, su were supposed to be going to, but they put it over here, and guess where they spend it? Administration. <laughs> they should be all teachers, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I've talked to Steve Buell on this, mm -hmm. on, on, this, on, this, on, this, on this issue, too, aspect of it. But the fact of the matter is, we got a problem. And so hopefully in 217, we got, to, we got to deal with it. But we can deal with some of the issues right now and maybe start thinking about the possibility of, i.e., making that part of the curriculum, what you're doing, part of the curriculum for future graduates of teachers when they go to school. Mm -hmm. It makes more sense. They don't know how to relate to that. They don't know how to deal with the whole shit. Race, they don't know how to deal with a pregnancy, all that kind of good stuff. They, you know, it's, it's, hey, what are you talking about? What's that problem? Then they try to create programs within the school system. Mm -hmm. which they, and, they don't, and the people who are there to try to create a program don't have the background to do it. And so at the end of the day, people said, well, what's wrong? I thought little Charlie, wait a minute, little Charlie went to school. Well, what's the problem here? You know, I think about Ronnie when he, that's why he was so popular. Ron Herndon, mm -hmm. when he put, put his head start piece. But they took him out of the community. <laughs> they made him president of the national deal. And the guy was really working hard right here within right the here. community. And the churches were working. With him. The moment he left, everything went down the drain again. When you were there, he was sitting right at the table about all of the issues. And you, like you said, you and your husband reacted to that piece. But they, hey, there's nobody here. And that's why we're, we're spending the time here, uh, you know, at the end of 16, year 16, saying we got a major problem, folks. And it's going to take all of us. And it, I, I know you want to spend a lot of time. Let's, let's talk about, hey, Trump shouldn't be elected. And we'd be doing the same thing if Hillary was elected. It'd be the same problem. The other side would be doing the same deal. We don't have that time to be fighting among one another. We got issues. We got these young people. We got our way of life. We got our education system. We got our family system. We got a lot of issues. We got issues here that we need to deal with. But this is one issue that, that in all due respect, impact your pocketbook. You're already paying for it. All you have to do is say, where is my money? Where is, what, what is happening to my money? That's the, that's the election you need to be talking to. You've got to get personally involved in the process. We're all elected to president. Just don't name one guy. You've got to do your part. You've got, we have to take, take control, if you will, of some of the issues and concerns we have within our own community. And here's a community right here, right here, right here in the Portland metropolitan area that we've been paying for Call your representatives and say, where is my tax dollars going for the issues that we're talking about that we've heard here on Oregon Voters Digest with Bruce Broussard and Becky at McCoy Academy? Call the United Way and ask them, well, hey, well, well, what about this program over here? They've been around for a number of years. They're saying they got problems. <laughs> where, where, where are my dollars? What am I getting out of my dollars? That's a fact. In fact, I, in all due respect, when I was running for mayor, I... I went up there and I talked with the director up there and, and told him about the program. We, we was talking about the, uh, the homeless and this, that, and the other and, and saying, can you give me some stats? And I said, can't you dedicate some of that money to kind of just, and you know, he was going to do it. But next thing you know, you, you know who's Bruce Broussard? 
I'm just a little nothing. You know, you know. <laughs> but trust me, I'm going to be on you, buddy. <laughs> we, we need to. We need to start. I'm, it's, even if it's my money, I don't give a damn if I gave you fifty bucks. I want to know where my fifty bucks went. I want to know who it went. I'm and happy I want to the take results. your fifty bucks, I and I are. can tell you exactly you, where it's I, going. <laughs> I want to know the results of my fifty bucks that I give money to these folks and whatever. <laughs> and the bottom line is that, uh, and we need to all be that way. You know, due respect. And I'm not trying to trying to hit no personalities of this, that, and the other. I'm saying for those of you who have made it as a result of the dollars that were coming in this particular area, you got to give back. You got to get back involved. And here's an opportunity. I'm not trying to, I'm not addressing dollars, this, that, and the other. You know, hey, just just take a website and, and she'll, they'll give you the background on this, that, and the other, and how you can get involved if you want to. I can't talk about monetary things right off the bat mm -hmm. here, but the fact of me is, just, it is a nonprofit organization. And, um, you know, there's, there's write offs. I'm not trying to tell you how you spend your money, but my point is that we've got to, we've got to be more responsible in 2017. We got some major issues with our young people in the area. Major man. I think about the police department right off the bat. I think about the PAL thing. Remember they had the PAL mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. Where they were teaching kids how to fix bikes and all this, that, and the other? They don't have it anymore. It's just put more money in the gang unit. Well, wait a minute. It's I can talk working. to kids. I mean, I talk to kids all day long. I mean, but what am I spending my money for? See what I'm saying? It's a whole different ball game today. And a lot of these young people that, in all due respect, that are getting in law enforcement, it, you know, I mean, it, it's singling them out and saying they're the problem. And you, and you put them out there, they have no background whatsoever. Give them a gun and keep on going. It don't work that way, folks. Trust me. If you can't communicate, you're in bad shape mm -hmm. if you're out there in the, in the streets. But anyway, long and short of it all, we got about a minute or so left and whatever. Again, uh, 16 has been great, but not so great. And can I say something? Yes, ma'am. Um, if anyone wants to look at our website, it's Oregon Outreach. Oregon Outreach. Uh, Oregon Outreach, Inc., www.oregonoutreach.org. And uh, uh, you can find out about us. We have other programs in other districts where yes. we are working, where we are funded by the district and able to keep our programs running. But that would be the website that would give you some information about who we are and what we do. And if you look us up, you're always welcome to call, come Good. by, you got meet a phone me, number? and, and 503-281. Nine five nine seven. Okay, fine. And what's the address over there on, on your Thirty-eight zero two Northeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And come there anytime, right? Anytime. Anytime they want. Please give Becky a call. I think I think it would be something of a surprise. It's not just Becky. It's it's all these issues that we're dealing with. We need to know where our money went. <laughs> I'm a taxpayer. That's what I did. I got up and that's why I called her. And I said, well, Look, how are you doing? Not not looking to do not too not too good, Bruce. But anyway, let's make Oregon great again. <laughs> we're gonna take that. We're gonna take the brand. Let's make Oregon great again, okay? Let's mm -hmm. let's help these young people because they are our futures. Trust me. If you want to retire right, let's let's retire the right way. <laughs> Save a child. That's what it's all mm -hmm. about. Becky, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Happy holidays to you. Thank you. Okay. Happy holidays to you. Let's make sure that it is a happy holiday. Give her a call, okay? What's that phone number again, real quick? 503-281-9597. Okay. Folks, again, have a happy holiday. Merry Christmas to everyone. Have a happy Hanukkah. I mean, go on and on and on. I know we have, we're very divisive, but, but the bottom line is that enjoy yourself. But, but like I said, we got work to do. See you next year, 2017. Bruce Broussard and everybody here. Take care. Have a good one.